Hi, I'm not in the shop today uh, because I wanted to share with you um, something else besides just how to use tools. And what I wanted to do was talk to you today about collecting tools. Um, antique tools, or it can be new tools, it doesn't matter. The point is that it's about um, buying tools and the way to get them and, uh, and different collections that different people have. We're actually in my tool room, which is uh, a little bit more than a tool room. I also have a game table in here because I have a, a card game that happened uh, every week uh, a while back before the COVID uh, showed up, so we've canceled that for now. But, um, but I want to share with you my tool collection and, and talk to you about a little bit about collecting tools and, um, and what, what's involved in it and, um, and what you should look for. So uh, we're going to start just and work our way around the room and uh, we won't cover everything because there's really too much to cover. But, um, but uh, let's say that you're, uh, you, you, you like squares and measuring devices and things like that. There's a, this is a wall of a collection of uh, framing squares, bevels, different types of bevels. These are bevels here, um, different age periods, tri-squares. Um, framing squares, uh, combination squares. This is a Veritas angle fi fi uh, finder that gives you these different angles that you can use. Um, here are marking gauges and panel gauges. And so if somebody collects just measuring devices, and there are people that do that, um, this is a nice way to display them and get to see them all and live with them, but you can come right out of the shop and grab them when you're using them. Some people collect saws. Um, this happens to be a, a, a butcher's saw for sawing through bones, but it just so happens that this blade and the tension on it works perfectly for doing dovetails, and that's what I use it for. This is a, a, a child's saw out of a, a old toolbox um, and uh, it, it's a uh, it's a very sweet cutting saw and then of course a back saw um, so there are people that collect all different saws and vintages um, I don't have a lot of them only because um, they're very hard to maintain unless you're really into them and and, uh, and you have to be cautious buying saws online because you don't know what quality the tooth or the teeth are going to be in and if you're not good at sharpening a saw yourself, you have to be wary. And in back saws, when you're buying those, you want to be cautious because you don't want, um, you know, if it's loose in here or if the saw isn't straight, a lot of times uh, they won't saw right. So you want to be cautious when you're, when you're collecting things like that. They're also very difficult to ship because of the size of them. So consider that. around the room now and I'm going to talk to you about some other different collections. Um, I'm going to step over here and show you this collection of uh, these are, are screwdrivers, reciprocating screwdrivers and push drills down here. And um, these are Yankee and North Brothers and good old Pratt and, um, and this is a Reed Lightning. This is one of my favorite things. Um, it basically works with a, with a clutch, and you see here that this part spins freely. This is lignum vitae, and, um, and basically the way it works is if you hold them both here, it will turn the screwdriver in like that. But if I were to pull it back out, it would reverse the thread, so that's no good. You want to push the screwdriver in. What you do is you hold on to the driver, you release this top part here, and you can pull back and you see it pulls back without the screwdriver turning and then you can go forward again. This is, I've forgotten the date of this, but it's over 100 years old. I have two of them here. Um, and and some of these other ones, this is an Archimedean style uh, drill. And then this is the more typical type that you find uh, that are uh, Miller's Falls and Yankees. And then these here are, are drills, and the way those work is it's the same spiral piece, but it's inside, and your bit goes here, and basically as you push it, this will spin. And so it'll drill like that, and then inside the, the uh, handle are different size bits.
So this is a little collection of them. There's probably four times this number still out there. And, um, and I'm still looking for the oddball ones that I don't have, the really small ones. Um, I have most of the really large ones. And one of these was my first, one of my first tools when I was a kid, my father got it for me. And uh, when I used to hang cabinets in the cabinet business, it was great because you could reach up and drive the uh, screws in holding the cabinets and it gave you that much reach. Um, but since then I've become addicted to the different patterns and designs, the double spirals, the double helixes, and all of that. As well as here are some of my, uh, my compasses and my dividers and my uh, calipers. And uh, basically I just hung them on the wall as a decoration, but I use these on the lathe in the shop. Um, some are inside calipers for measuring the inside of, uh, of an opening. Some are outside ones. They all serve a different purpose. And as you can see, I have a few planes. Um, a lot of Stanley planes, but they're not all Stanley. Um, and they go vary in sizes. Um, I think the smallest one is the number one, which I have over there. Um, but um, in the number twos are in here. And then this starts with the number threes, the number fours, the four and a halves, the uh, fives, five and a quarters, and the fives. And uh, I'm gonna step over here so you can see more of them. Um, over here are the jointer planes, the number eight, corrugated, smooth, the sevens. Um, here are the number twos. And uh, a lot of people like to make these cribs for their planes and, um, and, and they lock in and they basically take the plane and they make a little holder down here for it and it locks in and holds it. I find the easiest way to display them and get them when I want is this nylon cord, which is very strong, so it won't drop them, and a little screw, and they're pretty easy to just take up and, uh, and, and use and then put back. Uh, each thing has a tag, and that's mostly because I'm forgetful. So a lot of times, I don't remember um, when, when, what the date of the plane is and uh, when I got it. And so I put all that information on the tag so I remember it, so I have it later. I don't keep a log of it, but that's my easiest way of remembering. And then that way, um, if, uh, if anybody comes along and asks me about one of them, I can refer to it without having to look it up again. And so here are the scrub planes over here. Um, and then I, I kind of use them as shelves for certain little items because I enjoy looking at my tools as well as using them. And I, and I know a lot of people uh, buy them not to use them, but just to enjoy looking at them. So I'm sort of in between the two. This is my toolbox, and this has all my drills and my uh, different, uh, and my chisels are in here. Um, so uh, it's accessible because right in here is the shop. So this is the easiest place for me to keep stuff and, and, uh, and get to it in the shop. Now, you're coming across some crowded shelves here. Um, you can see there's a lot of business going on here. Um, these are all combination planes of different sorts. Um, uh, Trout and uh, Bailey and, um, and Stanley planes. This is the, uh, the number 55 plane. Inside here I have my spoke shaves. There's some oil cans, different things, and I set them around sort of decoratively, but all of these are labeled so that I know the types of them because I want to do a video for you guys on um, on the combination planes, not just the types of the different uh, people that made them, 
and the different designs of them, but also just of the Stanley ones, what were the chains, changes that they made in them as they went along? Um, now, I'm going to step over here and, uh, and show you some other things. He's going to keep the camera on this higher area, and um, we'll show you some other uh, tools. Um, in here are my circular planes, or my compass planes, and, um, and all of these are the ones I've done videos on, and they're the different types. The earlier style, um, where the, you didn't have the adjustments, it seems that a lot of the planes the early ones were bare minimum, what they needed to do, and then as they progressed and the changes came, there were more micro adjustments available and different ways of handling the blades and the cuts. Um, here are some chisel planes, and, and these are uh, Stanley Roundover. I haven't done a video on those yet. This is the 72 chamfer plane. And then up here are mostly my scrapers and some newer planes that, um, that I, I, I haven't done videos on, but I use them. These are all different scrapers in here. Um, so, all the blades for these planes are all behind each plane. And, um, and uh, I don't use them all, but I have some of them set up to different setups so that I can just grab one and either do a groove or do a rabbit. Um, but understand that if you're buying planes to use, you do not need anywhere near this number of them. You, you really, um, this is just all about studying the changes in these planes between a, a Type 1, a Type 2, a Type 3. And, and uh, I should explain what the types refer to is that people, as people started collecting the planes, people started doing studies of what they consider to be a vintage of the plane or the type. The reason they call it a type is there has been some change in the design. Even though it's the same number plane by the same manufacturer, there's been some change in it that, that has determined that when you buy that plane and it has that change, then it is going to be a type four. It's just a way of putting it into a chronological order. So um, over here I have all my spoke shaves and my draw knives. Some of them are, uh, are just uh, hung here so I can see them easily, so when I, I don't have to go into a drawer to grab them. And then over here, we have more of these combination planes, um, but they're different types. An early Stanley, um, this is actually a Paul Hamler reproduction of an early Stanley because the early Stanley is so rare and so expensive nobody can afford it, or many, many people can't. And, uh, and up here I keep all of my wooden planes, you can see them on the top shelf, and, um, and some of my braces, including my great-great-grandfather's on the very end there. And then here are trammel points. Trammel points are used like a compass, basically, to, uh, to draw circles or arcs, and, uh, and they are points that can go onto a wooden board, or in some cases, some of them have a, a, a metal bar that comes with them, and, um, and that way you can draw large arcs. Um, and then on the walls, you can see there are a lot of yardsticks and rulers. And I have a, a preoccupation with uh, measuring devices and collecting them. And then on these shelves are all my smaller planes. Um, I'm going to step over here so that uh, I can turn around and point to some of them for you. Okay. So these are the smaller planes. These are this is a, the Wood River uh, version of the Stanley Number no. One, and this is the Lee Nielsen version of the uh, of the Stanley Number no. One. And these are all luthier planes. You see how small they are, and some of them have uh, round bottoms in different curvatures, and therefore uh, carving out the backs of violins or cellos or any small model making, that sort of thing they'd be used with. Um, 
And then up here, these are the same things, but these are the miniature spoke shaves, and therefore that they have serve the same purpose um, for hollowing the back of, uh, or the, the carcasses of musical instruments. And then up here, you can see are the core box planes that I did a video on, um, on for pattern makers. And then these are all of my different rabbit and philister planes up here. Again, the yardsticks everywhere. I just uh, had been collecting those since I was a kid because they were free. And it's always easiest to collect free things. Um, and then up here, some of my block planes. And, uh, and, and then my levels. And it goes on and on and on. But what I'd like to talk to you about right now is not so much these tools, because you might just like one thing, whether it's a measuring device or whether it's a plane or whether it's screwdrivers. Some people collect screwdrivers, some people collect saws, some people collect machinery. Um, but uh, I want to talk to you about collecting because whenever you're collecting uh, a tool, the number one thing you want to do is make sure that it's a quality tool, that you're getting what you, you, you want. Um, some people are collecting them and trying to find that missing link to what they have. They have like 10 of something and they want this one particular type and they, they're looking for that. And it used to be, uh, it used to be very difficult to find things, but, um, but it was cheaper because you could go to the flea market or tailgating and you'd find the tools there. Um, and, and then it got easy because of eBay and other auction sites online that, uh, that you could find the tools. Um, but that drove the price down because there were so many all of a sudden available. Uh, a person in North Carolina isn't going to find that tool in Iowa. Um, and, and lately, and I want to mention th this, there's a, a new thing on Facebook, which is phenomenal. It's called, uh, Can I Have It? vintage uh, tool auction and it, they specialize only in uh, vintage tools and and tool related items but it's a group of guys that got together and figured out that they could uh, uh, be able to do auctions every weekend you can sell on that site as well but you can also buy and uh, and on the weekends they have auctions and um, and somebody will put something up whether it's a uh, a magazine about woodworking. It has to be woodworking related and it has to be have to do something with tools and vintage tools. Um, but you can put something on there and then just for two days or two and a half days uh, people can look at it, peruse it, and they can bid on it. And there's no fee for it or anything and in some ways there's some honor systems going on but it's a phenomenal way to find the tools that you're looking for at really good prices. And I think that's one of the reasons they started that website uh, or that page on Facebook was so they could help uh, new woodworkers, the people that are getting into the field, um, be able to buy tools uh, at a price that they can afford. Because e e eBay, even though it lowered the prices initially, now some of the really rare tools you can't, you can't even touch because um, the prices are so high. So this is a way to, uh, to be able to go in there and find excess tools that people like me have that we're not using and we don't really ha love. And so I've put several things on there and, uh, and sold them and been very happy with the people that I've been dealing with. Um, uh, there's something about tool people that uh, I think they're inherently honest. Um, uh, if it's a tool dealer, I won't necessarily say that because of many times they'll hide the fact that there might be an issue. And that's one of the things that I'll warn you about is when you're buying tools, you want to make sure that you look at pictures of every side of the tool. You don't want to, uh, let's say it's this uh, number 95 you're buying, you, you, you want to make sure that you see this part and this part, so you can see if there's any breaks. You want to be able to see the blade out of the plane to make sure that there's not some rust in there. Or there are some people who, what they really enjoy doing is restoring planes. And so they don't care about the rust. And that's fine, 
But if you're buying one to use, and I think this is something that you have to come up with on your own, is whether or not you're going to be a user of the, of the tool, or if you're going to be a, re, a, a tool restorer. Um, what is it that you love to do? And you, then you buy the tools that suits your interests. Um, and, and it's important that you understand what that is before you go into buying it so that you don't have any regrets. But um, I've bought several things on that site, on the C-I-H-I, Can I Have It, uh, Facebook page, and um, been very happy with everything I've gotten. So I'm kind of giving them a plug because that's become my new favorite place to go to, to see what people are collecting, other people are collecting. It's not necessarily even to buy. I like just going on that site and watching what other people are listing because then I see what people have. And I've learned a lot because I've seen tools that I've never seen before. And uh, there's usually a little bit of a discussion. I, I think on Tuesdays they introduce uh, a tool that may or may not be in the auction on the weekend. And then you're allowed to talk about it in the, in the groups. On the auction days, it's really not a lot of talk. It's people bidding for it, um, and which can get your adrenaline pumping. So you, you got to be a little cautious. You got to know what the, price, the value is and how much you're willing to pay for it before you start going after it. But, um, but it's a really great site to, to go to and, uh, and learn from and, and get some new things. Um, as well as if you have, say, because I have, I have a couple of uh, Stanley 45 uh, combination planes that are doubles of what I have on my type study. So I don't need those, and I'm going to put them online sooner or later. So it's a good way... To, to get rid of that and then uh, take that money and buy some tools or the ones that I want. Anyway, I, I, I hope I haven't bored you too much, um, but, um, but uh, this is my tool room and my little collection and, um, and my, I guess they call it a man cave, but it's a, it's a, I think it's a woman's cave as well. I, I, there are several women on that site that sell tools and buy them. And, uh, and there are many women now that are doing woodworking and, and some really fine woodworking. So uh, I don't think it has to do with being a man cave or a woman cave, but, um, but I, think it's, uh, I think it's something that uh, everybody can learn from, enjoy, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this little tour of my uh, tool room. Uh, thanks for coming, and I'll talk to you later.